Hallelujah. Death is lost and love has won. Hallelujah. It's like, woo. God, kick butt, man. That was like, woo. Very cool. Can you say kick butt in church? Oh, I guess I just did. I guess you can. At least here you can. Praise God. You know, I want to just thank uh, Pat Morley for playing host last Sunday. Um, Heard he did a marvelous job. And then all the, the builders who came and were able to share, uh, that was cool. Hopefully you enjoyed getting a little bit of a glimpse of some of the things that were involved in this, the two different buildings that we've been here. And, and then my dad, too. I want to thank my dad for kind of playing cleanup. Or, you know, he didn't know. I said, Dad, here's the deal. Here's what's happening. The builders are going to share. And I said, I'm not sure how much time you're going to have. But whatever time you have, you know, then you've got to fill it in. So... He said, sure. And I understand he actually abided by the time. So my mom and dad were in the first service, so I was giving him all kinds of kudos, gave him a, a gold star. So uh, later on this summer, um, he's going to be able to have a whole Sunday morning service to preach. So yeah. Yep. He has a lot in him that's just dying to come out. So... We will give him an opportunity to let some of that that's in him uh, come out. So that'd be cool. Um, let me tell you one more really quick story about the bike trip. Bike trips are really amazing. You drive, we went, we covered just over 5,000 miles, okay? Um, the last day we put on 875 uh, just to get home. And we were just, I mean, we sacrificed, we tortured, we hung on to that motorcycle. We wanted to quit, but we didn't because we had our wives waiting for us at home. That's right. There you go. Uh Uh-huh. You ride all that distance. So now we got home at 11 o'clock. We left at 7 in the morning, got pulled in at 11 o'clock at night. And, you know, we've been riding in the dark for quite some time, so you're just really keyed open for deer, you know. You're going for deer. And I just, at the last gas stop, I said, now, guys, gave him a little rally pep talk. I said, guys, here's the deal. Now is not the time to start racing because you're so close to home. To be foolish, we've made it all this distance. Most accidents happen within 20 miles of home. So just take a few deep breaths, take an extra breath so you can get home. So that was my last little exhortation, right? So we're, we're going, and as we get to the different cutoffs, you know, people leave cut off to get to their house and stuff, you know. So after North Shore Drive, Brian Collins keeps going, and I took a left on 235th, so I'm heading down 235th, down the road where I live. So I'm going down there, and I'm keyed open for deer. And I'm coming up this little rise through like a wooded area. And out of my left peripheral, I see this big light, uh, like a, almost white, uh, it appeared, rushing towards me. And I thought, it's too high to be a deer. What's going on? So I'm on my brakes, but I'm tentative. What's going on? Here, a great horned owl just cut, I mean, like right in front of my windshield. He just came swooping by. I'm thinking, you drive 5,000 miles. Don't come near anything. You're, you're almost at home and you get wiped out by an owl. I did hit a bird, yes. I did. A bird hit you. A bird hit me, yes. A, a bird hit me. Right in the side of the head. Poof. Yeah. It was, like, it was like somebody just come up and sucker punched me. We're going all of a sudden, the bird just appeared out of nowhere and just bang. It's like, man. But I'm willing to take one for the team, Randy. I'm sorry, I'm talking my yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Did I re- can I remind you, he's got the little wrench? I love you too. <laughs> oh man, get wiped out by an owl. Wouldn't that be great? Man, oh man. That would be a cool story to tell. Don't you think? I got wiped, by, I got wiped out by an owl. No, you're right. It, this doesn't sound very good. <laughs> I guess it doesn't. Um, it is Mother's Day. And what a, what a wonderful day. We're going to start out by directing your attention to the large screens.
loves having it so easy. <laughs> we, their lives are fun, simple, and, and so rewarding. Sometimes I wish, instead of being the dad, I, I wish I was the mom. <sighs> Another day of pedicures, reading my magazines, and making myself beautiful. This is the life. <laughs> he was doing so good <laughs> up until the vacuum cleaner oh man you know it is really true though in all that the are just the complexity of everything that a mother does uh, it really truly is amazing uh, there's a particular passage in proverbs and ladies relax it's not in proverbs 31 it's in proverbs 30 where um the psalmist is writing and he's He's making an observation of things. I'd like you to turn there. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 18 and 19. For years, I have just really identified with this particular passage because as, he, as you read this, you get a sense of what the, the psalmist was writing because I too have felt the same thing. And there's a fifth that I would like to add because whenever I read this, whenever I think of this particular passage, in my mind, I always add a fifth, which you'll hear about in just a minute. 
Verse 18, the psalmist says, There are three things that are too amazing for me, four that I do not understand. In other words, he's saying, there's things as I've observed in life that are just like, wow, they're just overwhelming. The first is the way of an eagle in the sky. And isn't it true? It's kind of an amazing thing. How can you take it in? Every one of us, when you see an eagle in the sky, you can't help but to be fixated on it for a while as you take in the majesty of not only the creature itself, but the way it soars. The way it is the master and exercises dominion over the sky. It's just, it's an overwhelming thing. And the psalmist is saying, I don't understand that. It's just, it's just amazing. And the second, he says, is a snake on a rock. That's amazing too, but I don't ponder there too long. <laughs> the way he comes up, he doesn't have any warmth. A snake cannot warm himself. He has to get warmth and heat from something else. Third, he says, the way of a ship on the high seas. He's thinking there, if you contemplate this, how does a ship stay on the sea? You got all these monstrous waves. I mean, it's floating miles around. You can't see land forever. And this thing stays afloat. I mean, that's, that's just an amazing thing. And then the last one, he says, the way of a man with a maiden. I have laughed along with you as you've watched young boys the way they perform around young girls. We can laugh only because we are no longer there. Although we still, like little boys, like to perform for the ladies in our life. Not only the ladies in our life, there's something about you get a woman uh, in the room and a, a, a man, they just, they act goofy. And the psalmist is saying, hey, I've seen this and I just... It's, it's an unexplainable thing. The way of a young man with a young girl. Now, young ladies, I am glad you are too young to understand the power that you have. You are the most powerful thing next to God in this universe. Thankfully, you do not know it. You don't learn that until a later, little later in life. Yes, about 35, okay? And then you have us wrapped around your little finger and we are stuck. But it, is, it really is an amazing thing. Let me just digress for just a moment. And gentlemen, let me help remind you of what the power of a young woman in your life did. I noticed watching our boys in my life and in your life as well, it's the notice of a young female that caused you to take showers without being told. Without being forced by mom, you actually started asking for deodorant and aftershave, some cologne. Why? The power of a young maiden. Now, ladies, you do not understand this, but the first time we took you out on a date to a movie, we took you, we were just so thrilled you said yes. We were sitting down and we, we were planning and scheming more than you could imagine. We wanted to get our arm around you so bad, so badly. But we just were afraid of rejection. Like, you know, we start to reach over there and you swat it down. Or for fear of us trying to reach around, you say, what are you doing? So we, we planned, we strategized, we, and then we finally got the courage to really go for it did the old stretch thing and we kind of and we slipped it around and we didn't dare touch you we were just on the chair but because you didn't say anything we left it there we're like oh yeah this is now again you had you were oblivious to this but we were ecstatic just to have our arm even close around to you it's like we were like whoa but yet we went further like we always try to do. We thought we'd reach out and try to actually touch your shoulder. And we did with fear and trepidation. And you didn't move. We were like, yeah. I'm touching her. Whoa. At that moment, we were so grateful for uh, anti-depressant or, or uh, anti-perspirant. You know, because we were sweating profusely, but we couldn't smell a thing. 
It was divine. We were like, oh, wow. Now, here's another thing you ladies did not understand. Ten minutes after starting that, our arm being there, our arm went numb. We could no longer feel you. But were we going to move our arm? No way. We don't care if we can't feel it. We know it's touching you. And that is good enough for us. We're just like, yeah, whoa. And then, so then the movie's finally over. It's time to leave. And you take your arm. <laughs> and you don't want to offer her a fish to hold, so you move around the other side. And you, anyway. It's amazing the power of a young maiden. And that's what the psalmist says here. He says, he says there's things I see that they're so majestic, they're so... They're just amazing. I, I can't comprehend them. And the last one he says, in the way of a man with a maiden. Gentlemen, it's true. Now, we will not confess this usually in public, but it's true. Most of the injuries that have happened in our life is because we were showing off. We, we were showing off. We were trying to boast or we were trying to get rid of that little wrench. If you weren't here early enough for me to explain the little wrench, I'm really sorry. But it's, um, that's, that's what, that's what we, we do. And he says, it's amazing. But and I want you to say, and I've, I've shared all that to just let you know this. For years, I'm telling you the truth, whenever I read that, in my mind, I add a fifth. Not that you can add to Scripture, so what I'm going to say is not divine in any way, shape, or form. It's just me. When I read these four things that are overwhelming, I, in my mind, always add a fifth. And here's, here it is. And the way of a mother with her child is amazing. It has always intrigued me watching a mother with her child. It's been a while. We've been empty nesters, Orlean and I, now for a few years. So it's been a while since we've had little kids. So I, in a vicarious way, enjoy watching you young moms with your kids running around. With you with your kids. And it doesn't matter if they're they're in your arms or they're teenagers next to you. I, I watch you and I, and, I, and I laugh and I giggle to myself and I just admire because they're, it's, it's a hard thing to take in to explain. And I think it's one of the most beautiful things ever, the way of a mother with her child. It starts right away even with pregnancy. There's right away this, you always hear about it, but it's true. And us guys really do appreciate it. There's this glow about a mother in pregnancy. There's just, she just glows. And um, again, it's been a while since I've been able to pat Orlean's, you know, extended belly. And I have not yet patted Chanel's, and I've come close a couple times without even really thinking about it. I'm just like, oh, that is so cool, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you know, um, I didn't, I didn't brook either. I kind of, you know, whatever. I, sometimes I have to be careful because I'm in Walmart. I see a pregnant woman. I go, oh, is that ever? And I go, I can't do that. People look at me like, who in the world are you? <laughs> Some freaky old guy. <laughs> but it, it, it's just, it, it's this amazement, wonder of a mother with her child. And, and then the child is, is born. There's this nurture and this care that you can't, again, it's, it's amazing. You can't describe it. Whether she's nursing or bottle feeding, the care that she takes in that intimate moment. And then everybody talks about the baby getting milk drunk. Isn't that the greatest sight? What's really funny is I've seen Orlean on many, many occasions on milk release drunk. Um, it, it's just this most beautiful, wonderful thing. And, and then even as they get older, in their early teenage years, this care of protection. They're always watching after them. And I see it a lot because being on a motorcycle, if you pull up, and a mom, when they see me, will grab the hands of their kids. <laughs> they don't know who I am. They just see a, you know, a biker, and it looks like, Johnny, get over here. Mary, get, you know, get over here. And, and I say, hey, would you like a ride? No. <laughs> <You know. laughs> This protection of a mama bear. And all through the life, it doesn't matter how old they are, get the admiration that a mom has for her kids is truly an amazing thing. And 
There's all this and so much more, but I have to tell you, it's only part of the story. I was thinking about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and, you know, she was greeted by an angel, and she was told, you're going to have a son, you're going to name him Jesus, and he's going to be the savior of the world. The forgiveness of sins will be through him. She was told that Elizabeth, her cousin, was pregnant. So she went to visit her, and, and upon visiting her, Elizabeth says this phrase that is prophetic in a way that did she really understand? I mean, it's amazing. Here's what Elizabeth said. Why would the mother of my Lord visit me? Why would the mother, it's her little cousin, why would the mother of my Lord visit me? Mary, no doubt, had to kind of go, Then the day of the birth, the shepherds appeared, not appeared, and they tell this incredible story. Yeah, the heavens opened and the angels were singing, and they told us this strange story that there was born in Bethlehem tonight, the Savior of the world, to rejoice and go down and see him. You're going to find him. He's a little babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, and you'll see him there. And they're telling her the story, and in Luke chapter 2, verse 19, it says, but Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. All these things. No doubt it was one of those things you just, how do you, how do you take in the magnitude of all that was happening? I think about mothers today. All that you ponder. All the things that you take in and you hold close. At times because there's no one to share it with. At times because you cannot even articulate the feelings and the emotions that you have that are happening to your kids, but you, you ponder these things, you take them in, you carry these things. I would like to share with you and have us just reflect for a moment on the strength of motherhood. On the strength of a mother. As we look at her strength and take it in from a whole different angle, consider her even more worthy of admiration of praise and appreciation. On the Good Friday services in the past, I, I have shared a message one time talking about Jesus' physical pain, his emotional pain, and his spiritual pain. And I was reflecting, and I want to use those three points to reflect on the strength of a mother. These things that at times she can't share with anybody, but yet she just kind of keeps them. First is physical pain. I tell you, moms, you're incredible. I mean, the whole pregnancy thing, it starts out with puking. I don't know about you, but I hate puking. I hate throwing up. And back even in my drinking days, my goal for every Friday night was tonight, that was my goal, tonight you're not going to puke. That's a real high goal, isn't it? <laughs> Failed every time, too. I mean, it's horrible. You know, worshiping at the porcelain god and seeing your shoe come out your mouth. I mean, it's just bad. But moms, they, 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 they just, they're heaving their guts out in food. You, you catch a whiff of some foods, and it's like, Mike, get out of here with that. Turn the fans on. Get the, you know, it's like, it's just a burrito. <laughs> you know, it was fine before. Now what's the problem? I mean, there's the physical pain, not only of, the, na of the, the, the nausea, but the sacrifices of your diet. Things that you could eat, now you can't. You used to, now you got to. Um, have you seen prenatal vitamins lately? I mean, you talk about pain. Again, guys, we don't have a clue. But this is all because of being a mother. She's going to swallow these horse pills. These are good for you. Yeah, if it doesn't choke me kill me before I even get in there. Then there's all the doctor visits. There's that growing uncomfortableness, the pain. Every once in a while, I'd see Orlean sitting in a chair like this. And I'm like, nobody's near her. What's wrong? He's pushing on my ribs. I, you know, I, I'm trying to be my helpful self. I walk over there. Hey, now get off in there. After a while, it gets so uncomfortable, you just, I mean, it gets to the point, I believe God invented, the, created this way, the pregnancy is nine months, you know why? Because all the pain you're going to endure in just a few moments, 
it, you have to be so ready to do that thing. You're willing to do anything. Because that's what delivery is. It's the ultimate of everything. I'm willing to do anything. I'm just so uncomfortable. I can't sit. I can't stand. I can't, my back hurts. And all the pain. Then there comes delivery. I kind of wonder what it would have been like before sin entered the world. Because in Genesis chapter 3, in the beginning of verse 16, it says this. To the woman, God said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. Wow. Then again, you, you ladies are incredible. I mean, if it, it was up to me, we'd have one child. If it was up to any of us guys... Every married couple would have one kid. <laughs> That'd be it. Because after the pain of the first one, we'd be done. That's it. Okay, I gave him or her to you. That's all you get. But you ladies are so incredible. You soon forget all the pain of childbirth, which Bill Cosby, for us guys, tries to get us to comprehend it by illustra illustrating it this way. Birth is like grabbing your lower lip and pulling it up around your head. <laughs> the strength of a mother, the physical pain you go through, not only in pregnancy, not only in delivery, but then there comes the, in a sense, the rest of your life. There's the night feedings. You get up, you're tired, but you do it. Why? Because you're a mother. There's all that lifting. Then there's the extra groceries and the laundry now. You know, they say that we as guys are the stronger sex and the women's the weaker sex. I tell you what, I don't understand it because I can lift a lot of weight. You give me a baby, after about three minutes, my arm's dying. It's not that I want to give up the child. It's like I cannot hold him or her any longer. You don't understand. Oh, come on, Mike. You're a big, tough guy. No, you don't understand. My arm is dying right here. It's going to fall off and I'll drop the child on the floor. You don't understand. And, and moms, you can sit and hold that baby for hour after hour after hour. I'm just like, I don't get it. It's amazing. So many times, you endure pain that you'll never share with anybody else as a mom. You go without so that your kids can have. So many times you, you put off redecorating your house that you want to do because, well, the kids, you want to keep them in sports. And the expense goes there instead of in your house. Or you put off buying that car. You, you think to yourself, well, I can drive this thing one more year because the kids need braces. Or the kids need this and the kids need that. So you as a mom, you go through that physical pain of sacrifice. I, I tragically remember... You know, my mom and dad did not have a lot of money at all. I was growing up, and, and, and I want you to know that I've already apologized to my mother. I've already made amends with my mother. I've asked her to forgive me, confessed. But I can remember on more than one occasion when I was going out with my friends, she did not want me to have no money in my pockets. So I remember seeing her reach in her purse and grab out their last $2. And she'd give them to me to make sure that I had some money in my pocket when I was out with my friends. Now, little did she know I was going to use it for drugs which made me really guilty. I'm thinking to myself, my mom made a sacrifice so that I could have. Moms, you endure all kinds of pain. You're incredible. And you do it gladly in a way that we often fail to understand or appreciate. I think not only the physical pain, but the emotional pain that you, do, you go through. Your emotional pain starts right away during pregnancy. Am I going to be a good mom? Am I taking care of myself? Am I eating right? Am I getting enough sleep? Am I not being stressed? Yeah, you're stressing. <laughs> yeah, but I shouldn't stress about stressing out because I don't want the child to be all hyper and you know, weird like his dad. <laughs> so there's, there's all that going on during pregnancy. You know, the emotional stress of am I going to be a good mom and what's going on? And, and then as soon as the baby is born, there's the guilt. It increases oftentimes. And the emotional pain that you experience, am I going to be a good mom? Am I going to know when to discipline? What if I let the baby cry in there and, and they're, they're, they need me? How am I going to know the difference between if they're hungry or if they're, they're just being fussy? And, and there's all this stress. Am I going to be a good mom? Tragically, for most of you moms today, 
fact that most people work, husbands and wives both, you go through the guilt and the pain, emotional pain of separation. You need to leave your child with somebody. Or... I asked Brooke um, just yesterday, um, the mother of our granddaughter, Ashton, she, I asked her, I said, hey Brooke, I said, you know Mother's Day tomorrow, I said, can I ask you a question? She said, yeah, go ahead. I said, what's the biggest pain that you experience being a mom? Because here's a young woman, 21 years old, new mom. I asked, I said, what's the biggest pain you experience as a mom? She said, without head, she says, there's a lot. <laughs> I thought that was insightful. But she said, probably the greatest pain I experience is leaving Ashton all day, wondering what happened in her day. What happened in her day today? You single moms, you're just plain old incredible. Don't get me going. I mean, you've got to do all this and more. If I had a gold medal, I'd like to pin it on your chest. The emotional pain of seeing your child sick and there's nothing you could do. Then there's the whole variety of the dependency or the uh, seriousness of the illness. And how you, you carry within you the sense of emotional pain that you wish you could solve your kids' problems. You wish you could take away their hurt. And then as they get a little older, there's this whole idea of they get rejected. When they experience rejection, they go to school. Are they accepted? Are they making friends? And, and you, as you experience them go through all these trials, you carry that just like Mary did. You ponder them in your heart. You carry them like a burden for your, your children. I'll never forget one time, I, I, you know, you feel it all. It's like, you know, again, every mom and dad can experience this. We're kind of tough. Don't hurt my kids. I don't want to see my kids hurting. I'll take the pain myself. We lived in town, and Samson was probably around five years old. And I used to play around with the neighborhood kids because they'd come around because they thought I was, you know, kind of this cool, big, fun toy, you know. Because they'd come look at my motorcycle and I'd treat them kindly and in my cars and whatever. So I'd, and, and Samson was always around because he was just old enough to be around and running around. And real often I'd play kickball with the kids and all that. And Samson was a part of that. And well, one day Samson comes in, just big old crocodile tears coming down his cheeks. And I said, Samson, what's wrong? He says, they won't play with me. He went outside to play with the kids and they said, go home, we don't want to play with you. And I was... There was almost a murder in Forest Lake. <laughs> but real often, it's, it's, it's you, Mom, that your children come and complain to and talk about at school. The rejection, the bullying, the things that your children have to endure. And you know as they share it with you, you're only hearing part of it. They get yet a little older. The emotional pain that you carry is not... It's not less than it's not, in fact, if anything, it's heightened because now they're starting to date and now the rejection can be so much more severe or tragically, the being taken advantage of with a date rape or something like that. And you as a parent, you, you carry that. They struggle with their job. And are, they, are they struggling with getting a job? Can they hold a job? And you as a mom, you carry that for them. And then you also, if they make good choices or bad cho if they make bad choices, you take that upon yourself emotionally as well. You, you take all the responsibility for the fact that your son or daughter is making poor choices. When you raise them right, that's not you to bear, but you bear it anyway. Then there's the spiritual pain. Yeah, the physical pain is one thing. The emotional pain is intense. But there does come that time where the spiritual pain... Because more than anything else, what would it gain to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? I can tell you this, what would it gain, what would it profit for me to win the world and lose my own kids? There's something about a mother. You know, I'd like to, I, I tell you that I am trying to set an example for you dads. I pray for my kids every day. There's seven things I pray for my kids every day. Number one, top of the list, I pray for my kids every day, is that they will have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, it's got to be theirs. It can't be mine. They can't have a relationship with Jesus through me or through their mom. But that they would have a real relationship. Now, real often, it's not dads, unfortunately, 
but it's the mom who's praying for and cares for the spiritual welfare of their children. How many of us came into the kingdom of heaven because we had a mom that just wasn't going to give up, that wasn't going to take that addiction, that wasn't going to take that stupidity that we were living and just continue to bombard heaven, saying, Lord, are you aware of my son? Lord, are you aware of my daughter? You know where they are. I'm not giving up. Don't let go. And they're interceding. And like Mary, pondering these things in her heart, a mom carries a spiritual pain for her kids. And here's the deal. You do it all joyfully. Because you understand that that's what a mom does. The psalmist said, there are three things that are too amazing for me, four that I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a maiden, and I always add, and the way of a mom with her child. You know, that never goes away. doesn't matter how old you get. I think it was, I can't remember if it was Friday or Saturday of just, of just this week. I was in the office, and Pastor Robin was in with her, mo- uh, with her mother, and they were just getting ready to head out as a mother and daughter outing. And it was just so cute, because you could see Robin's mom was just excited and happy and bubbly just to be with her daughter. And Robin was just as bubbly and pleased to be with her mom. And I'm thinking here is, you know, Pastor Robin's 40-ish or so, at least, isn't she? Somebody tell me. Is she not 40 yet? She's not 40? How old is she? I don't know. She's not a kid. She's got children of her own. You get my point. Okay, she's like old. Not, not really old. But she's old. She, yeah. I'm not sure if I'm going to say middle aged (laughs) Um, you get the point but I still like I said I just it's always amazing to me watching a mother with her daughter so I saw those two and I just I just really just beamed I kind of I just enjoyed it here they're getting ready to go out and have a, a manicure and a pedicure and I was just like that's just so cool I, I told my mom in the first service, tragically, she never had any girls. And I said, Mom, I'm not going out with you to have a manicure and a pedicure. That's not going to happen. When she goes in the nursing home, I will visit her, though. And pluck out the hairs as they grow out of her chin. And make her eat peas when she doesn't want to. I want to close with this. It is from Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31 is a great passage talking about the virtues of a hardworking woman and a wonderful wife. But it ends with, and it concludes with this, and this is where, where I will end as well. After we consider, Mom, how worthy of admiration, praise, and appreciation you are. For like Mary, you ponder and you just carry in yourself the physical pain of being a mother, the emotional pain of being a mother, the spiritual pain of what it means to be a mother, and you do it with joy. It says in verse 28, her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the wonderful mystery of a mother with her children. Father, what a beautiful sight at every age. Father, I ask that you would add a blessing to motherhood in our society. May we begin to continue to elevate it, to lift it up, to make it noteworthy and praiseworthy. And Father, we do praise the mothers in our life. We ask a special blessing as they carry some pains in their their life that we'll never know of. 
but they do it gladly. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand? Hug a mother around you. If you've got a mother around you, give her a big old hug.